Uh, good evening and uh, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have Jacques Herzog here at the AA. He's uh, a great friend of the school and uh, it, uh, it really is a great honor that he's here tonight. Thank you all for coming. I think the uh, title of the uh, talk tonight, uh, Architectures of Herzog and de Moron, subtitled Art and Non-Art Projects, Excluding the Tate, is uh, a very good description, I think, of uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Herzog and de Moron, especially the bit which uh, says the architectures of uh, Herzog and de Moron, because I think over the working over the last 20 years, uh, both Jacques and Pierre have been involved with a series of projects that really in some way resist the notion of, it, of the singularity of architecture and speak very much about the plurality of the kinds of, uh, of projects that uh, they have been uh, working on. Often uh, working with uh, a reduced, in a sense, palette of, uh, of uh, materials in a very economic sense, uh, they have been able to work through a whole series of, of architectural problematics. Architecture's position in relation to the project of modernity and tradition, the role of materials, the relationship between art and architecture are only a few of the topics that they have touched on through their work, working through architecture itself in a way. What I feel is, is particularly important about the work of Herzog and de Moron is that the very contemporaneity of their projects relies on a kind of tensional relationship uh, on the tensional reworking of the material itself, both physically and conceptually. In a uh, relatively recent interview speaking about their, their, their work, uh, they talk of the, uh, Jacques in particular I think was speaking of uh, the question of tradition, the role of tradition, uh, which I think is a very uh, good uh, uh, example, in a sense, of where they stand, where, how they resist this uh, constant kind of duality that we find in contemporary practice between modernity and tradition. Jacques says uh, in, uh, in this interview, something like tradition doesn't exist anymore. This is not only true in architecture, but in most areas of our culture. An architect cannot base his work on traditional information anymore. This means that all the security and self-evidence architectural work in traditional cultures used to have has vanished. An architect has to base his work on something else, something he must bring to the project. But what? 10 or 20 years ago, modernism was still hoping for a new modern tradition and postmodernism offered to remake imagery from past eras. But today, Making an object is a new problem each time. What is a theater? What does a window look like? How should a railway engine depot or even such a simple thing as an office building look like? I think tonight we are all looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, Pierre and Jacques do with all these projects. Would you join me in welcoming Jacques Herzog? Good evening. I think it's the fourth time I'm lecturing here in this building. The first time was in 83. That was um, our first lecture in England, in London. Um, we combined this lecture with a little show at the Nine Age Gallery. At the same time, Zaha was opening her show here in the school and she was so much more well known than we are. We were, and we were very jealous. And I, so I always, in some way, remember this um, this time when I come in this building, in the bar upstairs, where she had her big, wonderful paintings. And it was a new world for us. And today, um, we have ourselves. Um, a foot of our practice in, in this country, in this city. We have our own office in this city and we have a very wonderful project we can work on. And I'm sure that we would like to talk about this project in the near future, but not today because it would be almost um, a talk within itself, a lecture within itself to talk about uh, Bankside, about the Tate, about um, all the problems we um, are facing there. Um, but we are talking um, 
I, I, I would like to, to present a few other projects which are dealing with art spaces, but also non-art spaces, as the subtitle says. And it's a very special, maybe strange lecture, because um, it's basically a very new work I'm showing, and I'm trying to relate it, um, I mean, to connect it with other things we've done. Um, so it's a very um, intimate, and um, uh, I don't know exactly where it will go, but um, it's the only way I think we can do lectures at the moment that we are presenting things that we are working on at the very moment and not just telling what we've done years and years and years before and repeating that endlessly. It's just so boring and it doesn't bring anything to the persons who do the lectures themselves. So um, if you're interested in older projects, please try to look uh, at them in books or wherever you can find it. Um, maybe we can start with the first slide. Um, by the way, I think it would be fantastic if after the lecture, which is, doesn't last very long, maybe not even an hour, we could talk and you could ask me questions, also very critical questions. I see that Florian is, in, is among us, so <laughs> he is for sure one, cri one critical voice that might uh, say something. Um, this first slide is an aerial view of Bonn, the German city, and you see these two buildings. Uh, do you have a laser pointer or something? Yeah. Sure, just in the corner is a stick. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, good. This is better. These two squares are big, very expensive, um, rich museums. The Kunstmuseum Bonn, done by Axel Schultes. And this terrible thing here is um, the Kunsthalle, the Bundeskunsthalle, done by uh, Peichel, Austrian architect. And this museum forum is one of the most prestigious art projects in Germany, in, done in the 80s. And um, the main collector, private collector, who gave his work, his collection to this building, to the Kunstmuseum, um, Hans Grote, a very important collector of German art, he wants to do his own building. And um, so we, they commissioned us um, to do a third building on this site, which would contain the collection of Grote, which partly would move out of here and it's very important work. It's only German art. Um, the very famous names you've heard of, uh, Gerhard Richter, um, Baselitz, Polke, Beuys, um, Penck, <coughs> um, Blinky Palermo, one of my favorites, and a few others. And um, Grote is a very special collector, and he wants a very new, very, very different building from what is here. And the problem is the site. There is almost nothing left. They just gave us this narrow stripe here, which is actually a parking lot. And the architects also didn't really want to get involved in this project. And they also, in some way, um, have a problem with this third building to come here to in some way disturb also the classical arrangement of the actual um, site. Um, you can see a little closer. This is the art museum, the Kunstmuseum and the Kunsthalle. This is this square, this plaza, the forum. And this is our building here, which will be much narrower, uh, but very long and very tall, double the height as these things. And these two museums being very high-tech oriented, very um, sophisticated in terms of materials as well as um, um, the, 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 
mechanical ventilation and the lighting and everything. The one we propose will be also due to the tight budget, extremely, extremely um, simple and extremely primitive and almost brutal. So we tried to really enhance this part and the collector um, who is very, um, very strange man but also very open for such a solution. He really wanted to go this way to, do, to build a three-story <coughs> building which would be all concrete, almost a monolithic box. The project is also called Kunstkiste which means art box. And so we don't make any difference between the different star uh, floors. We don't want to have a hierarchical um, differentiation within the building. Um, like the, the maquette, which is a concrete maquette about this size, uh, the building is going to be all concrete with concrete floors, thick like this with no insulation and no additional material, not for the floor, not for the ceiling, just paint whenever an artist wants his space to be painted. And we don't want to have anything on the roof, so the water, the rainwater, will fall down, will run down the walls, like from a rock or from your head when you walk in the rain especially without hair. It's a special <laughs> feeling. <laughs> the windows, there would be only side light, no top light. The windows, which would be more than five meters high, would be very, very high spaces. No, it they would be six meters high. The, the spaces would be very tall. It would be very grand in some way, but very simple. The windows will be like eyes, very sophisticated. Um, maybe I'll go back one thing. Very sophisticated, slightly shiny, um, maybe mirrored glass. So the very strong contrast to the primitive quality of the concrete. We will also treat the concrete, but we don't know yet exactly how and what we are going to, to do with it. I show um, a few examples of concrete buildings we've done. This is an example of uh, Dijon, the student houses, um, housing in, in France, where we combined locally cast concrete with, uh, where we added black color, black, it was tinted, black tint, and the brighter, more pol polished quality of the uh, prefabricated slabs that we applied to this structure and the combination with aluminum and glass, which have a very similar surface appearance uh, as the concrete. So the intention was to, to um, use materials, different materials with a similarity in the appearance. You can also see that here, where the concrete, the, the, the aluminum frame and the glass are almost working as one, one thing. Another um, building we finished uh, a year ago, or a bit more, is the engine depot uh, that Mosen um, mentioned before, which is an all-concrete building where the windows, again, flush with the, the concrete wall, um, where the windows have a similar function to, to enhance the, the, the primitive quality and the roughness of, of the concrete. In this case, the, the light boxes which are applied on top of this concrete wall reinforce this um, contrast. In the background you see the, the copper clad signal box which is standing in this same area. Go back to the art box. A um, few more slides. You can see the, 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 the rainwater, what I've spoken about, and another building where we work with rain in many other projects at the moment. We try to use rain water um, on the surface of the buildings to, like in this case, the, the thing that we like so much is that 
the water and the light, the combination with the light, make this solid, the solid concrete wall more transparent than the transparent wall here, which is the polycarbonate, the glass wall, which is printed with the um, silk screen print with, the, with the, the photographic image, like in the roof here, um, inspired by um, uh, old photography of uh, Blosfeld. So this is one of the um, examples where we used water on concrete. You see in, in section the, th the equal height of the three floors and the very simple arrangement of the, 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 the different rooms. There is a, a hole in the building, a kind of a courtyard, where the, we will have one tree inside the building because we cannot control the landscape. We also don't want to control the landscape. We just want to put this concrete box next to these two sophisticated buildings, like a big wall at the end. The, the actual buildings will have about reach about this height, so this will be really a big wall at the end of this square. And you go from from one room to the to the next one, and each of these spaces is um, is um, has its very specific installation uh, done by um, every artist. This is the tree I've spoken from. I've spoken about the tree belongs to a piece of Joseph Beuys. So the piece, the tree, the nature is also part of the exhibition, part of the program, and the rhythm and all that of that stuff here is has been realized in tight um, collaboration with the collector and with the artists. So the, it's an artist's museum in some way. Um, we have, from, of each space, we have, this is the floor and this is our wall elevations. We have um, done these drawings showing exactly which painting will be where. So it's a very controlled layout, a very controlled curatorial concept for this building. Um, this is, um, I think that the, this is Gerhard Richter. Yes, this is Gerhard Richter. Uh, and uh, another example of poetry, I think. I cannot recognize this. It's, it's just uh, here to show you that the spaces are not, let's say, um, designed like you do normally in a museum where the curator has come afterwards and use the spaces and put art in it, but the, the art is, has been first. This is another project, um, a, a building, an art building we've just finished uh, for, a, for an artist who we work a lot with, um, Remy Zauk, the conceptual artist, this is his new atelier building in Mulhouse in France, close to, to Basel. It's the same type of a building like the Ricola building that we saw before, which stands very near to this building, also in Mulhouse, but where the, the cantilevering roof has a different function, has a different connection with the outside. Like in the Mulhouse building, we, have, uh, we collect the rainwater and let it go down on the, on the wall. In this case, the rainwater has a color, as you can see, the rusty color here. And we don't know yet exactly where it comes from, but it, comes, <laughs> but it probably comes from the polluted air. Because there is an old factory very close, this area here is a um, very nice garden area where um, in the 19th century, the, the rich, um, how do you say, fabricants, the rich owners of factories, um, printing, there, there's an industry of silkscreen printing, in um, textile printing in, in Mulhouse, and the villas, so the private houses and the factories were built next to each other. But um, this, um, Industry has become obsolete, and that's why Remy could have, could afford buying this property. And uh, maybe he suffers a bit from the bad air, but this is <laughs> this is one interpretation. You can see the size of the building, and what we think is very interesting in this project. It's 
that the whole building is like a full-scale mock-up for the showroom, the, the, the gallery spaces we would like to um, have in, in the Tate project. The kind of skylight we have uh, applied there for the first time, the kind of uh, side light is uh, what we have found in, in the Tate. So it's like a simulation in some way, but it's also, of course, a building we've planned before and we have thought about before in collaboration with the artist, with Remy, who we have done many projects together with. It's all concrete and it's an H-shaped building. You know, it's like um, two slabs and the building, which contains two workspaces, which in some way can also be seen as like museum spaces. This is the Ricola factory, which is the same type as I said before, but where the cantilevered roof is more of like an opening or welcoming gesture, and it's like a, um, an envelope or a, a gesture which gives a view inside, like in a cloth, like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a coat. Here you can see that the one of the main reasons we did this roof and we, we did this H-shaped um, form has to do with the outside, with the existing row of trees and this wall here. So this is like a continuation of the building outside. It's also workspace outside. The artist works on the two sides. He works also with silk screens. His paintings are mainly printed and very rarely painted in a traditional way. You can see in section. And the site, which is interesting because it shows the, 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 those single freestanding villa type of buildings and behind the big volumes of these old industrial the factories, which are still producing, but less and less. It's become obsolete and the whole area is being reused re, um, in a different way. You can see the, in the section already the type of skylights we are using, which are just very simple rectangular openings in the floor, flush with the, with the ceiling, with no particular sculptural interest, like you know that, may know from other museums, uh, those um, hung light objects and all these ridiculous things that you, you have seen in other museums, which don't make sense, neither for the art nor for architecture. You can see that here. And this system is so simple and so works so very well that we wonder why it has never been applied before. This is a view onto this uh, old factory wall with a row of trees and you see how the roof works and sort of um, integrates the outside. You can see the very simple layout with the two roofs here, cantilevered roofs. Um, then the very simple uh, bathroom and you know, wash areas to wash the sales screens, storage, and the arrangement of the skylights Of course, we would like to have as simple spaces with no joints and, you know, with this um, continuation wall between wall and ceiling, also for the Tate. But the Tate, of course, has much more technical requirements for, you know, technical, uh, me mechanical ventilation, all these things. So we will need to be, to do more sophisticated um, uh, details. But the spatial, spatial effect we'll, we try to get is quite similar to here. What we like is especially the fact that we can achieve these very solid 
almost primitively solid spaces which are not con done with a conservative spirit. It's not that we like this classical and conservative way because I think these spaces will have no, in no way this uh, uh, spirit of classicism or conservatism. But we like to have this feeling of weight and of stability which will more and more vanish in contemporary cities and once you go in such a space you feel like in a totally different world. So the, the concentration on the works of art will almost shock you, will almost hit you and we want this, penetra this um, perception, this encounter between art and people to be the most um, powerful one as powerful as possible. So that's the intention. It's not a stylistic or an architectural, uh, other architectural intention we try to get. You see that the, the glass and the, 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 the plaster and the wall and the ceiling are all one. And then we have a concrete floor or wooden floor, timber or concrete. Those are two or three slides from the Tate where we do similar, um, where we follow similar concepts. Where we try with these um, flashes here, we try to focus on every detail which might um, disturb this um, controlled spatial um, uh, power. In the Tate, we will have the side lights, you know, th with these existing mullions from the Bankside building. So this was also part of something we had to accept and we wanted to accept and we wanted to turn into a quality and to combine with the skylight, which makes sense together with these existing things. Um, in the section, this is the light beam on top of the Bankside building, this is just one uh, additional floor. So that's the top gallery floor. We have three above each other. And the top and the central space will be extremely high, about 10 meters high. And we will have here this type of light you have just seen. And in the middle, we will have another type where the skylight comes from, from top, from the side. On top of that, we will have the restaurant, which you can look forward to because it will be, it will have a very good wine list, very good food, and a, <laughs> and, and a wonderful view. Um, this is, this kind of space, I mean, the, the Tate one will be about four times this, you know, this size, you know, it will be double the height and so on, but it's the same type that we've also, also experienced in the Goetz collection building in Munich, which, um, which you know, by experience, we've, no, we've known through artists also, very different kinds of artists, that it works and it can be a wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful space. In this case, um, it works for uh, Ronnie Ho, or, uh, um, sorry an exhibition of Ronnie Horn and Felix Gonzalez Torres. Also two artists we, we like very much. But it works for very different people, you know, also for Arte Povera and painting. And it leaves, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't have a concurrence with, it doesn't make a concurrence with art, but at the same time, it's not that we, you know, we, we draw back from, uh, from um, being architects, it's not a problem for us. On the contrary, you, 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 you must try to do such a powerful space in order to give art such a tremendous um, impact on, on the visitor. This is um, Alan Charlton and a um, little painting of Helmut Fedele, a friend of ours. the same building from the outside, um, where you see how the glass, which provides the light inside, works at the outside in a way which 
interests us a lot. This is one of the real researches we do on the glass and the different faces of glass. Glass which is in this case between day and night um, something which uh, the, the the building sheen um, seems almost to float on this um, light. Light, sheen, uh, light sh uh, seems to be uh, like an energy, like um, has its own its own um, substance. With the change of light or day, it can have very different uh, qualities. In this case here, it's much uh, more rigorous. Almost, um, it seems to have its own volume. Um, so it's always volume, something which shows as um, an object by itself or something which vanishes, which, which almost goes away. And I think this building can have both sides, can have both aspects in very subtle um, differentiations. Or it <coughs> reflects nature, it reflects landscape, but it almost contains it. It almost is part of it. It's not just a mirror, but it's like frozen landscape. And this is something we are very interested in also in other projects. Like in this one here, um, this is a very little museum, a uh, cartoon museum. Um, it's actually an addition in the backyard of an old building you see these uh, little windows, a medieval building, where we added um, in the back, back of, the, of the lot a three-story building with three exhibition spaces linked with a bridge with the existing building. And on the two sides of the bridge, they are, there's a gap. It's little courtyards. And what interested us very much is to use these courtyards not as holes, as empty spaces, but to reverse it, to turn them almost into volumes, which are like light sources or like lamps bringing light into, into the new part, which is all glazed and which has a facade um, which is using fully transparent and slightly or more or less mirrored um, glass um, slabs. You can see here the bridge, then the old facade opposite, I mean on this side, and the two little courtyards which are working like um, you know glass or paper lanterns for the side that we are sitting In the section you see the old building, the street here, the little courtyard which has this bridge and the three exhibition floors. Um, in plan, again, the old part, the bridge, you can see these little things here and the f exhibition floor. It's always a mixture of day and artificial light which gives the light into this new part. The old part functions by itself. We didn't do very much in this old part. But you can see here the different um, quality of glass which also has a kaleidoscopian effect on to people who work through on creating more of an um, opening like you seem to, you know, to come close to this gap or to be contained within this bridge. Again, we were interested in looking at this as a volume, as a space, which is containing something or a space which is totally open without any, actually, boundaries or limits. The same thing. This is a view from behind, behind the, the new part. So we did this facade. We just took old tiles because it's exposed to a um, courtyard and we didn't want to, do, to invent a facade. So just, we just took these old tiles and clad it and left these two windows open, which are giving a view into this glass sort of um, glass world. A 
I think here you can see very well that also the way we, we you know, the, the, the rendering we, we apply to these old walls um, has a paper-like quality with the light which shines on it. And this is being enforced or enhanced. So not so much about showing old walls, but turning these old walls into something uh, totally um, new or other. It's about looking at something or being looked at something, uh, being looked at. But this um, two sides. Um, we have done uh, such a research. I mean, we th th this research between um, volume and opening and solid parts and transparent parts or images which are working like walls and questioning this all together or bringing it into specific contexts has been done in all the projects like in this one which is has been done for Olivetti um, for Olivetti Bank this was an um, exhibition project where we used um, gold reflecting um, glass, like gold bars, for um, video space, a showroom. And um, this is something we would really like to realize, and because this is a few years old already, and we have um, a chance this is already also a few years old. This is an existing building. This is not our design, I'm sorry. Um, of um, Munich project, the Hyperbank project, which is a huge complex competition we have won uh, th two or three years ago, and that we had to restart the whole project. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very large project in the, um, the old town of uh, Munich. And this whole part, this building and all other buildings in this block should be should should have been taken down in this original pro project and now the new project which we, which we think is more interesting even we keep part of the old buildings and leave uh, uh, keep part of the old buildings and add new parts so you never know exactly what is old and what is new and we link these things with different glass qualities and we we really uh, try to find a way through these old and new things and use glass in different qualities to guide people through this uh, whole, um, you know, block. Like um, we also use then the su a certain surface treatment so that people can recognize some areas like the bank part or the commercial parts. And these drawings are showing um, a walk through one of these different. Um, courtyards, we create very different courtyards within this whole block with very different shapes. We also work with different architects on this project. One part we gave to REM, for instance, REM Kohlhaas. Another part has, will be done by a German architect who's called Hans Kolhoff, who has more uh, traditional approach. But we, we like this combination of different styles. I just show this because in some way it's interesting for us to, u to apply these ideas about glass being more than just um, you know a traditional material to use it at an urban scale. Um, this house uh, is a private villa, Köchlin house. Um, is also, I think, an example in which can be shown in this context where, you know, these huge glass windows which are structural glazing where the frame doesn't show outside can slide outside the facade and create always a new image of the building. The building doesn't have one facade, you know, where the windows are cut out and then you open or close the window, but the windows, the window panes sliding outside, uh, change the building very often. And um, 
destabilize the, 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 the view or the idea you once have of this building. But in some way, it's also very stable. It's a very um, clear um, thing. You know, it's a very classical building in some way, which all of a sudden changes into something different because you have very large pieces that you can um, open and close the house. You can also close the roof and close this part and close this part. The almost black surface um, helps integrate the glass or with strong sunlight um, disintegrate these um, pieces. You see the, the courtyard which opens to the garden once it's fully open or when it is closed. Or at night. The same house, the entrance is a large ramp which leads you up into the building where you then end in a almost chapel-like concrete space. Uh, so part of this building are, is very, you know, solid and very almost earthy, almost, um, you know, about gravity. And um, this is this um, little chapel-like space, you know, where we have this bench and the wall which opens to the courtyard which is up above your head. We wanted this little painting of Helmut Fedele also. Uh, the same artist I mentioned before to be here because his work is about you know this kind of spatial feeling and this is a view back in the same space the entrance door and then you go turn right go into this or left from your side in the house again the detailing in this lower part very solid very um, you know, when you c are close to these things, you, you can touch everything and it's about real stuff. And then upstairs in the courtyard, everything is glazed and goes into different orientations, opens to the outside, has um, um, a quality to link the different wings of the house. The house is built in three layers on top of each other which have a U shape, which are U shaped. So and this U is always turning in different direction. One is, you know, are opening towards the garden. The other one is opening in this direction, which is where the, the morning sun comes into the garden and hits the bathroom wall. So this all this has very much to do with the light and the day and the change of the light during the day. Um, I think in this picture the roof above this courtyard is closed, as well as the sliding door here. This is the winter, kind of a winter um, image. And the courtyard, which f seen from the living space, is um, can be seen like a volume and not like a hole, again, the same you know, this is like a, a cupboard of glass which is built in the house or a box. And this is the last project I show today. Um, this is our first uh, American project, um, which is um, a winery. And the, the, beautiful, the, the landscape is so beautiful 
and the wine is so good that there is a good chance to do a good project and if we don't mess up the, the architecture. But I think it's a very, we have a very interesting um, uh, client, a very good client who is very open for a um, uh, special approach to this uh, project, um, which we try to um, you know, really insert in the landscape and to really try to work on the landscape about the stones which, which are there, about the plants and so on. And we like this building very much and this tree which is an old oak tree and we want to keep these things like a symbol of the whole winery which will stand in this part here. We broke ground last month so everything is on a good way. Uh, we, we wanted to keep this because it's such an American um, building and it's like a gate. This road will go and we'll, we will access the whole thing in a long ac um, road between this, this old barn, which is like, uh, you know, you could see Raikou playing um, guitar in front of this house and this old oak. And um, so this is the old barn, and this is uh, the oak and we put the building in here. This location has a lot to do with the quality of the soil, which is not having the same um, quality here. It's poor here in this area. And um, it's also good for to, to, you know, to, to bring the grapes from everywhere. And um, so it has also very good functional reasons. We also positioned it here to make, to insert it in within the the geometry and the structure of the site, which is like a text, which is like lines. And um, so it, um, it makes a lot of sense to have this this way and not, you know, here in front and to make a big landscape deal around it with trees and everything. We want to renounce and all these things. We just want to have these grapes, which are very high, which are higher than in Europe, which are about two meters high, and um, the, the hills. It's a very famous uh, site. It's called Napanuk. It's, it used to be an Indian site, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's a place which, um, which is very special um, in terms of topography, but also the quality of the soil. Um, the building we are going to do is a very linear, very long building. It's about 100 meters long, and it contains three facilities, which is the warehouse, the, or the, the tank room, where the grapes are coming first when they are during the vintage, and the barrel cellar and the offices. And we are trying to deal, to work with stone gabions. We would like to have um, to uh, use these metal gabions that you find everywhere in the world, which are normally used for landscape to, 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 to um, control uh, slopes or whatever, you've seen that before. But never it has been used for a building, as far as we know. And it makes a lot of sense to do that here because the mass of the stones are working very well with the um, with the heat, it's a very hot climate during the day and can be very cold in the evening. Um, so um, working with these gabions, um, we can reduce the amount of energy inside and we would like to do that even if in America they are not at all used to do that. They don't know what a wall is. They normally work with, with um, very thin wooden walls and they just clad it with anything with a concrete veneer or stone veneer or marble veneer or even wood veneer and so it was a shock first when we want when they heard we want to use this material but now they really um, are happy with it and um, we can also uh, use it we build this mock-up to convince the client and the technicians and the engineers that it really works and as you can see, we work with different sizes of stones um, because we want to have big rocks like this with big gaps between the stones so that light comes, shines in between so that we, when we have glass behind, that uh, light shines through from the two sides during the night. It 
would be wonderful to have uh, light shine through the stones and during the day uh, the sunlight is shaded by the stones. This plan shows the three facilities I've been spoken about, speaking about. The main axis will lead under this gate here, where we have the tank room here, which is basically a steel tanks. We have the barrel cellar, which is like the treasure room of the whole thing. One first year and second year barrel cellar. On top here, we have the offices, which will be all glazed. Uh, structural glazing behind these rock walls and the warehouse on this side. So we will, um, in the cross section, you can see the different um, height requirements and everything. Uh, this is not so important, but it's, it's a very deep, also, it's very deep, very wide, and very long building. And also on top, of the roof, we will have stones, not just gravel, but larger stones, so it will be an old stone filled or a stone building. You can see in the model here, which we put on the table in our cafe and in, in our Basel office, um, you can see the different qualities, the stone sizes. <coughs> in some areas, like where we will have the offices, we only have uh, steel, we, we, don't have, we don't fill in the stones. We just leave the gabions open and apply another mesh, layer of mesh, to just keep the, the sun away. And um, where we, have, we will have a terrace behind and, um, and, as I said before, the offices. We will also have an opportunity, you know, like this big gate, you will see the light through these stones will come in during the day. So we will have a kind of a Spanish or Mexican you know, like in the uh, Western movies, a big s covered square where, where the light will shine through these stones. And another thing we like a lot is that this, um, the use of these gabions has um, different advantages. We can show, you know, you can put more weight on the stone. We will have a very beautiful stone almost black volcanic stone, a basalt, basalt stone. And, the, the, and with, with the change of the light or with the angle you stand in front of the building, it's either the stone or the metal which will be more visible, which will give you a different um, view uh, of the building. Uh, thank you for your attention. Talk. Yeah, sure, there'll be time for some very critical questions, I think. I hope, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Joel, do you think we could have the uh, microphone? Does anybody want to ask something or know something better? Or maybe I was unclear about a few things? Yes. to know whether um, you felt there was a standard formula that you can use to exhibit artworks in the sense of the space that you've built. Um, if that's, that's the first question. Secondly, if not, is there a particular, how would you describe the variation that you use to exhibit different works? And could you explain that process? I mean, that's a sort of a split question. I mean, f first of all, I think that fortunately, even bad exhibition spaces do not really harm good art. You can see that in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which has the best art in the world and the worst building in the world. And they themselves are aware of that problem. And if you see um, the Bruce Naumans and the Rothkos and all these things, you just look at these things and you think, this is so fantastic. And they have, you know, carpets on the floor and the most terrible ceilings and lighting systems and so, I personally, I mean, we've always 
been very open about this. We are very critical about all these museum projects which have been done in the 80s, which are more exposing the architectures, the architects' um, fantasies, and I'm just bored by this. So we try to do something different. Whether it's better or not, I don't pretend. It's just another way to do things, and it's something which some artists or many artists think is is more interesting or helps them to, you know, to come closer to what they think one should come closer. And in old factories or industrial buildings, th they have experienced that. And when I say, it, I mean, what, what I try to explain is that we try to create spaces which are very simple, but in this simplicity or in this rigorous, um, way, you know, to expose also their own gravity. This is an artificial construction. This is not, you know, uh, something that's how the world is. This is very different and very, I mean, this is very artificial also, and we are quite aware of that. But it's something which we think will be very strong in the London project. It will be the, maybe the only museum of that size, you know, of that importance. It will, it will be one of the three museums in the world for the 20th century and for contemporary art, you will see art in a way that you haven't seen it before. And it leaves, I mean, the spaces will be very different because, I mean, they have the similar, they have a similar skylight, they have side light, some have side light, many have artificial light, but the sizes, the proportions are very different. And mainly it will be art which will give the special or the different quality to these spaces. And the, cura the, the curators, I mean, our, our, our job is to do spaces that can be used for many different shows and many different uh, uh, layouts. You know. I mean, the, the German project, the Kunstkiste, I mean, that was done for this or that particular artist, which I think is a problem, you know, because I think uh, this is, might become too chapel-like, you know. Um, not so much the building, maybe, uh, you know, this strong concrete thing can be very tough, but, you know, with the ch you can also put very different art in it. But when you always have the same artist and only this artist in one space and not another, this might be a problem. But this is a curatorial decision that's not our decision. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, with the Kunstkiste, whether that whether you were forced to deviate your structure because of the work that you were showing? Whether, I'm, I'm sorry, you I You were forced know. to deviate your structure because of the work that you were showing, the collection that you were showing, mm -hmm. whether the structure that you had planned had to deviate because of the specific... Deviate? To deviate. Oh, um, the, the walls, you mean if, 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 the, if the walls can be changed? Did the, did, the, did the structure of the building, did the architecture of the building in some way have to change because of the way in which you had to accommodate the, uh, the earth? No, I think we would have avoided, um, let's say, uh, walls or spaces which would be too special just for one artist. So basically you can take it, everything out and put other art in it. <coughs> That's for sure. I mean, this would be ridiculous. But they can always, I mean, in every museum you, you see that they build in for a special show, you know, they make a dark room for a special video installation or something. So, so you're able to do that. But if you fix that, I mean, if you did that as almost a structural thing, it would be stupid. But I don't think this is. Thank you. Um, this is uh, qualifies as a kind of critical question. I mean, I, I think the buildings are very beautiful, and having seen many of them in person, um, one thing that strikes me is that there are two kinds of typological continuity that are developing in the work. One of them is an architectural continuity, where there is a very precise uh, description of the exterior uh, elevations, how they're built, how they're structured, and how they protect an interior which has, in comparison, a very closed quality. They sort of reinforce its interiority. The second uh, typological continuity, or one which is developing, seems to be one to do with clientele who are becoming, in a way, more and more luxurious as time goes on. And they, of course, in 
partnership with this interiority reinforce a kind of vault-like quality of the interiors, protecting very special and specialized artifacts from art to wine. Um, the tendency of, that I see is that there's a kind of cancellation of the exterior. There's a kind of description of the architecture which either has very precise relationships to the exterior or cancels it out entirely. And I think you know, the Goetz collection is a real example of the architecture. Almost it's hard to pin down its substance. You know, the, the messiness of the outside seems to go away. And again, this reinforces a, a, a sense of not only interiority, but an exclusion of the exterior and a prioritizing of exclusivity of the interior. Now, I was wondering, this is the critical bit, is there a critical dimension to this work and about its position in the world? Vis-a-vis -vis the good, interior that's exterior. That's a very good question. I, I don't agree about excluding the exterior. I think we are, try, on the contrary, we try to really work with the exterior. I mean, this is a good example. But of course, this is a very luxurious um, example and you're absolutely right that there is a danger but not only ours this is with all so-called star architects you know they they get more and more commissions by rich people or because they think it's fan trend, uh, fancy to ask these or this or that guy um, then normally they are rich people and you know you create such places and while you know the big production is totally elsewhere and <coughs> Um, but we also have such projects. I could also make a lecture with this. We are working on a football stadium now with a developer, you know, and we have a only marginal role, and it's a tough fight. I mean, that's much more daily work and daily reality, what we do with these people, you know. And the question then is, do you do it or don't you do it? Because if it doesn't work or if we lose the control, it, you know, it's a total mess, and we really do a terrible thing. And then they say, well, they can only do small-scale things where they can control everything. But I, I think for every architect, it's, um, it's a thrill to do all scales and all kinds of things with all kinds of uh, clients. And today, it's more, it's, 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 it's a reality to either have these very special clients or then you're exposed to, you know, become, to be almost, you know, a marginal nobody, you know. And we think, we are very fascinated by doing these developers' projects in uh, Asia or in, um, in Northern Europe, but h how it works is not something I can, you know, it, it can only be cited from one case to the next. And this again has to do with the control you have on something or with how much, how far you can extend your, 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 um, your influence, you know, and how much money is left to deal with the exterior. In the, in the Kunstkiste project, we don't have the opportunity to do anything at the outside. That's why I prefer really to say radically, no, I don't touch it. It's like, you know, I put something and I don't care what happens outside. This is not that we want or don't want to do or to deal with the outside. It's just, you know, a reality. And very often we have been criticized from people saying, well, these guys do very beautiful facades. They're really, you know, it's about the outside. And, but in fact, the space of the architect is more and more squeezed to, you know, to the outside because inside everything is given, you know. Everything is given, and the outside, almost everything is given. So, n you know, you're really squeezed between, between two powers which, you know, don't almost leave you anything. And then you try to, to find some specific quality, um, and to find something which, you know, relates to the outside or the inside, or in a good case, maybe two, the two of those, uh, outside and inside. But very rarely, you can control everything, and you can really have an, 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 an impact on, 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 on these things. So it's not so much something that decides. It depends on our intellectual, you know, it's not that we want or don't want this or that. And um, the critical dimension in architecture, I think, is very important. 
to be aware what can you do and then do that with a certain power you know to really and I think the art space for me is such a moment of power where strangely or paradoxically we do less than other architects at first sight but you maybe we do more at um, if you look closer to you know to create a better or more powerful um, yeah, it, I think I described it quite well before. Um, I mean, our intention. Um, to, to, I mean, to have a power, you know, if you, I think that if you create spaces which have a power, which have an impact on people, this is a very political statement. Because this is so different from mass media. This is so different from something which is just for the eyes. And this is one of our main intentions. But you cannot do it in every project. If you're reduced to the skin, you are reduced to an another media, like, you know. But Jack, I think in terms of the, um, the project in Dijon, for example, this becomes, uh, uh, I think, an interesting question because in that project you have the possibility of dealing with something that involves repetition or the seriality of the, of the project. And at that moment, the whole issue of the interior, the rooms of the students, the way in which the rooms are used and so on, become, I think, quite an important part of the project, quite an interesting part of the project. Now, in terms of the way that you're articulating the argument, the emphasis seems to be fundamentally in terms of the kinds of effects that architecture produces. Now, in projects like Dijon, there's also the question of the way in which, in a sense, architecture produces uh, certain uses or, or the uses of the project itself and how you are, through the, the orchestration of your, of mm -hmm. your critical intervention, also transforming, for example, the project of student housing. Now, what I think is interesting is that in, the, in projects like that, you somehow decide not to show the interior. You don't show the plan of the, of the, of the project. And so it becomes quite important, uh, I think, as a question where you, for example, stand in terms of the whole history of the, of the polemics of modernism. In relation to a project like that, one would have imagined a figure like Corp being very, in a sense, having a very particular position in terms of the kind of life that the dormitories would produce. And I think in projects where you have this opportunity, this is an area where you're being a little bit reticent. And I'm wondering whether it's a deliberate uh, position or whether you feel that, again, it's something to do with the circumstances. I think it's a very good example, Dijon. I showed today just a facade because I wanted to speak about concrete as a you know, facade element. But in fact, in Dijon, um, the client gave us the brief, which is in France, if you know French, uh, laws, you know, you have to exactly follow each square meter. You cannot do one more. So we wanted to have an impact on the space because the space defines how people can work outside. And if you know the project, we have worked with these very large um, cursives, we say, um, these very large corridors, you know, which are double the size. So we sort of cheated the client by doing that because he said this is outside. It it did it, yeah, it, it didn't cost anything, you know, to make it wider. And to, so we, because we couldn't have any change inside, we wanted this to be the major space that we created. And I think this is successful in, you know, unfortunately the warm season is in July, August, and then when it, this is when the university. The <laughs> but now they have summer programs, and it's a very, it, it really works well. I mean, this is, um, this is something we really did on purpose. So we, 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 and even Jeff Wall, you know, the artist, who is very uh, social oriented, very social oriented, was very interested in this project for this particular reason. He wanted to make uh, shots in this area. Um, because this interested him more than, you know, these discussions about uh, the smoothness or roughness of concrete. I speak of that in a certain context, but it would be stupid only to, do, to deal with these things, you know. But very, the, the, again, very often you just don't have a fucking influence on these things, you know. Nothing. You just, you know, they, they just cut it away, 
you know. And um, you must find strategies to really seduce the client or to, you know, to combine, you know, change of the brief with something that maybe commercially brings advantages or the stadium now, the football ground, is absolutely the same discussion. You know, we we want we would like to extend the, the public platforms, you know, and to bring it more to you know what is around this area. Now, it would, uh, this is actually a very interesting uh, example, but we can only do it when you know this platform in some way contains or covers commercial space underneath. Um, there is a limit to this and. It's exactly this discussion, but at the end, maybe in a lecture, I will only speak about you know the glass well with which we cover the, this thing. You know. <laughs> but I, I think you, you, you can also not you know explain everything, and you know to, you explain your like your own art historian, which is ridiculous, I think. But I think that's why it's very good to have uh, critical questions because. I think this critical potential of an, or the, this reflecting potential of architecture is, is ac actually what we're really interested in. And when you say the role in history or the, the, the critical dimension in the world, I, I think it's exactly this amount of, um, of, um, of um, stuff or sub substance that you find in one's work which is, which is important, which is necessary. And not just you can discuss the facade only or, you know, the whatever. Yes. These are many questions. questions. Yes. First part is easy. Um, yes, I think. Uh, of course, it was. Um, yeah, I, of course, there is some criticism in this project, you know. But it's also, again, you know, the architect, in fact, doesn't have such a power. You know, we are, you know, the client, the money, and so on. But you try to put all that together and to really give a certain energy to the whole thing. I think every architect tries to do that. And in this case, the scale, the position, the material has to do with all these questions. Um, we wanted to do a different museum. That's clear. But we also had to do a different museum. And the position was given. It's only about the height. And uh, you know they wanted us to do something very small and tiny and behave well behind this thing. So that, that, that you know, so this is, there's a strategy, a side strategy behind that. And this has to do with the scale. This building, when you see the maquette, you see, uh, you think, how high is that, you know? In fact, you will be astonished how high this building is because these windows are six meters high. But they look in the model like, you know, maybe they could be two and a half meters or something like that. But this is a scale scale, scaleless idea. We want this like a giant behind this, um, these two other museums, which, you know, which in some way behave like old temples and try to, um, you know, welcome people in a, in a, in a way that, um, like they go to the opera, then they go to the music hall, and it's, uh, you know, what we call in German uh, Bildungsbürgertum. 
which is neither about scale nor about art nor about anything. So it's in some way it has um, uh, a shock. It, it, it works like, um, like, you know, like you hit something or you hit somebody. And this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is, a, no, but this is again a strategy which I think is important because you need to in some way um, attract people, you know, to, to, to speak to people, but not with a language that you learn at school, but with the, the language of architecture, which is the material, which is the form, which is the way you put something, which is pure architecture that use this to speak and to apply to the senses of the people and not to reduce the senses to just the eyes or maybe the ears with the sound. And so this is a clear strategy. And we will also have a small scale door to break the scale, you know, to, to sort of um, have this ambiguous um, um, ambiguity uh, within the whole building. And I don't know whether we create a style or not. That I cannot answer. This is not something I can. Um, but if you, I, I'm, I'm sure that some things come up again and again. This is clear. I mean, but we, it's clearly not our intention to to um, work within our style or to um, apply something to the world that we think is must be repeated or must be uh, said again or this is not the kind of uh, thing we are interested in. It's again the question about uh, space uh, versus the facade. And uh, I think uh, maybe you didn't explain enough about some of the spaces. Uh, in some of the projects, maybe that is the reason why there is a certain unease about this favoring of the facade, seemingly favoring the facade. Maybe, as I could see in the last project, maybe there is something about living in the wine factory, which could be making very special kind of industrious living space. Um, I think also in the first project about the box, I think this is a, I mean it is, <coughs> it's a very, I agree it's a, a very present solution. It's very tense. It's, it's, it's critical about the situation and that makes the project, I think, very strong. Uh, it's kind of, in terms of urban space, a, a tense and spannende solution. Mm -hmm. uh, but what has happened to the first I mean, project about the house, for example, that was under the tree? that was going around the tree, the house in the garden, where the tree was, so to say, the roof over the living room, and where the interior was almost like the interior of a musical instrument. And there were interior dimensions there, which I can't quite see in the later projects. Can you say something about that? Well, yeah, I think I, um, the one project you're think, speaking of is very special, the one with the tree and the interior. Um, unfortunately, the woman who lives there doesn't really live that s so much in a way that I would personally. But I think that our interiors, um, maybe I should give a lecture only about interiors so that people really think that. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think, uh, <laughs> Florian, no, I think truly that uh, the interior is, um, among others, the art spaces, where you don't look out to the nature, maybe this is your favorite perspective, but where you look inside in some way, you know, but, um, yeah, or the, the winery is such a space, or the villa is such a space, you should see that in real reality. 
Um, and it's, I mean, this is an excuse, but I mean, you actually cannot show interiors, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a I like to speak about surfaces because you can see that, you know, you can, um, and, um, and maybe the spaces do even have a certain picturesque quality, like um, have a certain artificiality, all of ours, you know, in some way, but um, because the traditional space the way the traditional space, which has a hierarchical quality, which has um, 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 has vanished and has gone, you know, the, tra the tradition that you mentioned that we feel so much that it has gone is really also something which, which doesn't exist anymore. But of course space exists, but it's the space that attracts us it, today is a, is a different space, you know. And the projects which deal with space in a traditional way are so boring, you know, because a library with these huge spaces and these things, you cannot do that anymore. I'm happy you cannot do that anymore. And, and so, I mean, I, other architects, are, are contemporary architects, are trying to find desperately new, you know, ways to, to deal with space and to... Um, to um, and you find new commissions where these new ways to deal with space are more or less, you know, where you can more easily and better deal with this. For instance, I was once in a in a in a dancing in a dancing hall that uh, Nigel has done in Istanbul, and I think this is an example. You know, a, a nightclub. This is something where you have a different possibility to deal with space and. Um, But for instance, apartments, you know, is very difficult if you're squeezed with all these square meters to do something which is, can be compared with your best projects. I must say, that's, I mean, the, the Dijon inside these the cellules, so the only thing you could do is to define the relationship between the window and the space, which is nice, you know, at least you have your own window, and that you can define a special way. But everything else is beyond your influence. I know Piers wants to ask a question, but I think, you know, the, the point I don't think should be necessarily about the interior versus the exterior, or that you do projects that are of the outside and then there are projects of the interior. I think one of the things that seems to be so crucial is that in many of the projects you have combined in some sense this relationship between modernity and tradition, which now in the case of, for example, the materials already make certain materials modern. I think that's very important in the work. So the way that you work through stone now makes a material that was thought to be traditional and old, now you make it new again. I think this is very important in, 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 in your work. Now, at the same time, what becomes interesting is, is in what way is then this reworking somehow begins to develop a kind of critical pr position in relation to modernism, in relation to modernity. Of course it does that in one, on the one hand, because of this thing that it does with, with the new effects, with the materials and the reworking and, and questioning the whole role of tradition in relation to modernity. But at the same time, it then becomes ambiguous in terms of the role that it actually develops in relation to certain polemics of modernity, whereby, for example, the c whole condition or question of housing that you are criticizing in terms of reductions to cellular size and becoming very small was the very thing that was celebrated as being a kind of minimal condition in some way. So, Given the fact that that was celebrated and people tried to make something of it, what I, what I think is interesting is not to simply, not to refer to it in terms of the fact that it is minimal, but whether it is possible with these, with, with these certain kind of reductions to now have an alternative polemical position, the same way that you have developed in relation to the question of tradition and the reworking or the rediscovery in some way or redescribing the sense of material. That I think is, it's not, it's not really inside and outside or the fact yeah. that interiors should have the same kind of effect, but that the interiors seem to present a kind of ambiguity in terms of where you stand in relation to the project of modernity or where you stand in relation to the project of modernism and so the history of that. So that's, that's I mean, to, ma to make it clear, just one more thing. I mean, we, fi we feel, we Go feel, on, 
just let me just finish that first. I mean, we feel very far away from the traditional periods. When I say traditional periods is um, like the traditional buildings that you find in every, every landscape in the world, you know. Uh, as far as from, from modernism, which had clear, you know, intentions, what the role of the architect should be. I don't know what the role of the architect should be, really, you know. I mean, every, even that you have to define. Of course, you have the client and you have the money, the budget and everything, and the brief, but um, everything else, and that's the main thing, is what do I do? What do I, what do I want to do? And what is the intellectual position you have in this whole thing? And um, more and more, we, we, when we work with artists and artist strategies also. This is a clearly a position in the world of architecture that we believe that art has been more important in the 20th century than architecture. Architecture, in my view, in our view, is not so important. This is a big <coughs> word, you know. Um, I'm, we are not so interested in the Corbusier or Alto and all these people, just not. And because artists at the same time have spoken more clearly, <coughs> more radically to people and have done, if you think of, I mean, an, an, an architect like Le Corbusier, he was also working as a painter. I mean, if you do such ridiculous paintings, how can you be an important architect, you know? And at the same time he was doing these paintings, there were painters like Bruce, Na uh, like um, Barnett Newman and, 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 and Roscoe and um, radical people like Ad Reinhardt, you know, who pushed something at an edge. And today in London, uh, young artists like Damien Hurst, like um, Douglas Gorn, like Rachel Whiteread, they have a radical position which attracts me much more than architecture. Mm -hmm. And we try to work, we, to deal with architecture in a way that applies or, uh, uh, directly to, to senses, to the people, like art does. I don't say we do art, we, don't, we do architecture. And because it's so much architecture, it's interesting. Not because it's a bit like art. It would be ridiculous, it would be like art, you know. So this is probably our position we're looking for, you know. And interior, or exterior, or landscape, or inside or outside, I don't really care, you know. It's one material, and we do as much as we can. We, we involve as much as we can. And maybe in our biography or whatever, you know, somebody finds out that they in fact hated the outside or they hated the inside or whatever. I don't know, you know, but uh, because the position of the architect is also minimized more and more, you know, B on one side you, you, they turn you into a big star, but in fact in real life you are now nothing, nobody, you know. I mean, no architect has a real importance in this world because the, our culture doesn't really deal with architecture, you know. And so, so the strategy of the architect has to do with this role and needs to have to do with this role, you know, to, to stay within the business and to attract also politi politicians and, 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 and um, to compete with other media. <laughs> um, the 20th century is not only about art, but uh, other arts like cinema which unfold and so on and one of the things that's striking in your work I mean suppression of modernism and so on is the suppression of procession any notion of unfolding even when it's there in the project I inevitably you seem to do your best to suppress that I mean staircases don't become major events taking you between floors and so on I just wonder if you'd comment about that but the whole processional idea of architect I can't think of any architect who suppresses it as much Procession. Yeah. Uh, in the Tate, we do um, how did they call that? Uh, ceremonial stair. It's a nice <laughs> word. <laughs> no, which is a stair that you walk up. Because I mean, you know, people. I think a good example: an artist, an, an architect called Salvisberg. I don't know whether you know him. He did the most beautiful stairs in the 20th century, in, and these are really ceremonial stairs because the steps are only high like this. So you really have a hard time going up with the rhythm today, you know, because stairs don't exist anymore in in contemporary architecture. They are really, you know, reduced to a to nothing, you know, they are hidden in, in, in concrete towers, you, you know, with a fire exit sign, you, you really, 
a stair almost doesn't exist. So you have lift or you have something else which moves your body, you know? And, and because everything moves your body and you don't move yourself anymore, you need to, you know, get rid of everything which moves. And then you go jogging or go running on these machines. So what should I do? What should I do to show these elements in our architecture because they don't exist anymore? You can have a special client could maybe wish to have a stair and he walks up. I like these movies, by the way, when you see, you know, the woman of the house walking down and, you know, the stairs. But um, today, can you imagine such a stair? I don't know. We recently redid the house, refurbished the house, and we, we, we took out one of these old wooden stairs, fully solid oak, and we burnt it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it didn't make sense anymore. It just. No, I think I mean we are very interested in that, um, and um, the way you enter a building or a space or this, these things are, are things that we are very much aware of. And but of course, it's different from, you know, in traditional, traditional cultures have more r ritual, r ritualized um, uh, architectural pieces. And this is more, we like very fluid um, kind of um, spatial sequences. Huh? The ramp, oh yeah, the ramp. Oh, you will see the, the tape, the ramp. No, the ramp will be beautiful. That is something where you really, uh, I mean, where you have this. I mean, the Tate, in fact, is much more about these things because it is um, so important because it's such a big building to lead people through this building without having signs everywhere to say where is this door, this gallery, to have this kind of almost natural or intuition. Um, you know, by, so that people understand the building by intuition almost. This is something we are, we are very interested in, this, this part of architecture, that you understand um, a building like in all the times you understood a city. You, you, in an old city, you knew where to go to the station and everything. These things are getting lost. But maybe buildings can be so big today that you can turn them into small cities where you have this kind of an intuitional um, way through. Most of what you talked about this evening is referred to art. Should I be doing this? Yes. Um, whereas one or two of your projects obviously touch on science, which is another of the great driving forces of the 20th century, um, such as the single box, um, which acts as a Faraday cage, I believe, um, in terms of physics of the idea of ice on the Rukula warehouse. Um, Accidentally on the building where you use where you have the staining, which is delving. Can you speak up? I d I'm sorry, I don't hardly understand you. Most of what you've talked about this evening is to, is to do with art, <coughs> um, whereas many of your projects also uh, touch on science as well, which is another great driving force of the 20th century. Do you see that as a, an influence on your work, as strong as art or not? Which which science? Science. science, oh. science have a role in your Physics, work? chemistry. Yes, 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 we, we are very interested in that because, because, <laughs> because we live in Basel. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, no, we are very interested in, uh, we are very interested in research uh, and in... Um, not, not just in research, though, but in the effects that that has on... Natural science. We, we, are, we are working on different things like treatments of surfaces and plants and things, but we are very limited in that. But we are very interested in how to know how these processes are working in nature. That you might know because we have also described this in some texts. Uh, 
Um, at the risk of being boring, I'd like to return to the question of inside and outside. Um, I think the house that you showed amply demonstrates the fact that you can design an interior and you can design in three dimensions. Um, what's very intriguing is that the most consistent thing in your work is that almost every project I can think of has some kind of membrane around the outside which forms a almost impermeable layer between the inside and the outside, which then sometimes you ero erode and melt and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in why that is so very consistent and whether you've ever been tempted to, to have the sort of building that, that opens itself up in three dimensions to the outside without the intervention of a, some kind of plane. Which is more sculptural and direct. Yeah, we, we, we also have projects like this. I think the, the Black House I showed is an example of that. Of course it has these sliding doors, but it is a very sculptural thing which has a... This is also strangely one of the buildings where we really, very, for a very long time, we didn't know how the facade should look like. We worked in the inside and we wanted the building to be as directly related to the outside. It, without, the skin, without nothing, we wanted to, like, you know, when you cut away the facade, we wanted to achieve almost such an effect. And strangely, you, you, of course you cannot do that. This is an old dream of architects. But we wanted to achieve, we, could, we achieved that through these sliding doors which are outside, so that the outside is almost like inside, because normally you slide doors inside. So the outside is really treated like, you know, in fact you stand outside. So this was, um, this is very strongly also a, a wish we have to um, not only always have um, a schleier, how do you say that? Um, a veil, but to to have this direct um, 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 contact and um, and even the shape of the buildings, you know, maybe most of them are rectangular, simple shapes. That also is changing. It's not necessarily something we we are interested in, but we were maybe not able to do that differently in the past. No, this is maybe a psychologically interesting question. <laughs> no, but in, in fact, very often, this has my, maybe to do with the site and um, to this monolithic kind of a thing which helps you to have a different encounter with what is outside, to more work as one thing, you know, with the other, without this figurative or too narrative character of when you have classical windows and all these things. So this is maybe something, and very few areas or sites you, you want to have this direct, you know, and visible contact with what is next to it and to relate in small scales and not as a whole. So this is certainly one of the things we, we try to find out at the very beginning of a project, whether, how it should operate. And then I've always said that we are very interacted by um, um, Islamic architecture because it has exactly this quality, you know, because it has, um, for religious reasons, um, developed an architectural strategy and also cultural and also um, climatical reasons, which uh, works a lot with these um, layers, you know. And, and yes, and, and with patterns and with tattoo-like things, and we are very interested in this world of tattoo and pattern, and um, which again hides not only it works as a monolithic thing, but it even vanishes the clear shape of something. Even if we normally use very simple boxes, very, sim very seldom they operate like that directly, because the way we treat the surface doesn't make the geometrical shape, volume, so evident at first sight.